Welcome back guys to your second part of what is coding. At this point, you know what coding is. But, better question, do you know how to get a job? Do you know how to interview? Well, if you don't, check out our sponsor, Pramp. Pramp is an awesome website where you can get paired with other people and do mock interviews. As you guys may have heard, technical interviews are very challenging. Pramp is going to give you what you need to succeed at these. On top of that, there are companies using Pramp to find people with talent. So you can get on Pramp, get some interviews done, and then do an actual interview with a real company and get a real job. There are people who have used Pramp to get offers at Google, Microsoft, Twitter, and more. So I'm sure you guys are not gonna be disappointed, so please be sure to check out the link in the description. And yeah, let's get started with our video. The primary reason people use software is for automation. Automation is enabling something to happen automatically without you having to dork with it. <laughs> With software, we can write an application that has some code and it can execute the same thing over and over and over and over again in a loop. So this means that we are able to make what typically is a complex process very simple with a program. So the whole concept of self-driving cars, it's automation. The reason self-driving cars are going to sell is because people don't want to have to drive. They just want to automate that process. Essentially, anytime you can automate things, that gives you time to work on other stuff. So if you've heard buzzwords like machine learning and AI and all of those things, essentially this all comes down to automation. So if I wanted to do something like fraud detection, what traditionally would have to be done when I buy something with a credit card, for example, we would have to look at our transactions and see if something was fishy, right? Well, machine learning is a way to automate this process and using data, it can basically say, yes, this is fraud, or no, this is not fraud. And this allows us to very easily swipe a credit card and it either gets approved or it gets denied because it's likely to be fraud. Obviously, it's not perfect, which is why when you go on a trip sometimes and you swipe a card, it doesn't work. But I think over time, it's going to get better and it's still more efficient than having people manually read transactions and try to look for fraud. Or an alternative would be to wait till fraud actually happens and then worry about it. That's also bad. <laughs> so this goes down to fraud detection and prevention. So automation is huge with companies. For example, if you sign up for a website, it'll send you an email to verify your email. This is all automation. This is one of the fundamental things of software programming. What can I do to make the user's life easier? 99.9% .9 of the time, it's automation. I want to do something that typically takes you a long time and is very cumbersome, and I want to do that very easily with a click of a button. And you'll pay money for that. So if I write this simple software to do it for you, I'm going to make a bunch of money. That's how software development typically works. So if we go back to that diagram for a second where we had code in the middle and then we had input and output, you could think of all of the possible inputs for a program, and you will quickly find out that there is essentially unlimited. <laughs> so this is often restricted with simple things like buttons, right? So when you make an application for a phone and you put buttons on here, you are limiting what the user is allowed to do. But for web applications and command line interfaces, it's a lot more tricky because people can just do whatever they want. For a web application, there is tons of security issues with this. And it all comes down to what do we allow as input and what do we not allow? So we might have one, two, three different types of input, just as an example. So this is obviously very simple because typically we're gonna have tons of inputs, but let's just think about three here for a moment. And let's say the third one here is illegal. What we want to happen is if we put a one or two, the output works. But if someone puts a three, then, then it loops back around and asks for a new input. This is often very complex because of the vast variety of possible inputs. So we need to do something called generalizing. This is more of a concept than an action. So it's not like you type generalize and something happens. No, this is how you think about it. We need to not only consider one, two, and three, but we need to consider every possible value that could be inputted in here. And how do we group those values into valid and invalid. So we basically took three possibilities and we made it more general. We didn't put one, two, and three, we just put valid and invalid. 
That's the whole idea behind generalizing a program. We want to make an application that works with all possible situations. So we really need to think of how can we take our code and make it work more generally to allow essentially any input and it's going to respond the correct way. If you think of how a computer works, it's very concrete, yes or no. It doesn't know how to reason. This means if we get an odd input that it doesn't know how to deal with, it can break your program entirely. So you need to have the proper safe measures to protect from all possible invalid inputs. Something that can ruin generalization are things that are hard coded. So the word hard coded means it's actually in the source code. Source code is just another name for the code inside of our coding box that I was talking about. So all of the code inside of our black box that takes input and gives output, this is known as source code. So when things are hard coded, it means that we actually put it inside this box. This can be dangerous because when we take this code and we give it to a customer, that is essentially the final product. We cannot change that unless we give a software update. And just so you guys know, the thing with software updates is that customers never want to do them. <laughs> and they can often cause issues with new bugs, everything like this. So we want to avoid software updates as much as possible. So generally, you want to avoid things that are hard coded. And I'm going to give you an example right now so you can kind of put this into context. Let's say we have code like this. This is very simple code that you might find in a programming language. This code should be valid in Python. Essentially, the 15 here is hard coded. That means anytime we run this application, 15 is going to be printed out in the console. What this means is that our program currently looks like this. The only single input that's even possible is 15. And this isn't even something that can come from the user. It's basically baked into this code. So it's the only value that's possible. So we don't even really have that input at all, right? So we're not allowing anything to come into this. The only value that's gonna be accepted here is 15 because it's written in the source code. We can't change it. So when we take this code, we give it to a customer, their age is going to be 15, even if it's not. Now, obviously this is a very simple and kind of stupid example, but you gotta understand that concept. That means what we need to do is instead of putting a 15 here, we almost need to leave like an empty bubble. And then we need to get this value from somewhere else that's not in the source code. A lot of times this is going to come from input, which we talked about. So we can have the input age. This can be done with code like this or something very similar for different languages. Now we can put in any age. So when we take this code, we give it to a customer and they execute it, they run the program, they can type in an age and it will print out that age to them. And when I get into my intro to programming videos, I'm gonna be doing a lot of hands-on getting you writing applications. But for now, this is purely conceptual. So just think about it right now. <laughs> the customer can type in an age and it will print it back out to them. This means that we just open this input to an entire range of numbers. So that is generalizing. The problem with generalizing though is that we have to worry about incorrect values. For example, what if someone put the age pizza? Well, that is not a number and it's not going to make our application work correctly. So this gives us unpredictable results. It makes things challenging, especially if we're expecting a number and we get something like pizza. Because of this, you need to do validation. Validation is a process to see if a value given is possibly correct or if it's garbage. If it's garbage, then we loop back and ask them for a new input. Once we have this basis, we want our application to do different things depending on the input. For example, if we made a game that you had to be 13 years old to play, we might have something like this. Less than 13, no, you don't get access. If you're greater than or equal to 13, then yes, you get access. That's all I got for you guys for video number two. Please be sure to check out video number three because in that video, we're gonna be talking about deployments, source control, and all kinds of cool new things. If you've enjoyed the content, please be sure to click subscribe, like, and I just ask that you check out the sponsor, Cramp. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.